Well, well, well. All right, all right, all right. And we're live. Hello. Welcome to the Burn KC Scorchcast. Um, I am your host, as is the case with every Sunday, Alex Blackburn. Um, Chiefs game just ended. And um, we'll talk about that. I don't. This this is the this is the most sick to my stomach I've felt about a win since I don't know how long. Uh, but we'll like I said, we'll get to that. Um, got a few things going on as a re- or excuse me. Got a few things going on too. Um, with KU, with MU, with K-State, um, not gonna be a super duper long show today, um, I do have to get off and study for finals at some point, um, so I'll probably keep this relatively short, but, um, that is the plan for the night, for those that, uh, don't know, it is finals week, and I am in a graduate program, so I would like to do well, um, but that being said, Still going to show for you today, as promised. Uh, my apologies for not having articles the past couple of days. Um, it's been kind of busy, but um, we're surviving and we should get back to that daily article routine this week for sure. Um, just lots of studying and events going on regarding people's birthdays and holiday stuff and all that. So just... Lots of stuff going on, but I'm here now, and I'm glad you are too. So let's get started. Uh, First thing I want to talk about, since it is fresh in everyone's minds, I'm sure, uh, is the Chiefs game. Holy cow, I thought we would have a good day today. Um, Once the Chiefs went up 27 to nothing, I I turned to my girlfriend, Sarah, and and I was just like, you know... If it gets to be like 35 or 42 to nothing, you maybe want to watch a movie or do something like that. You know, just it looks like a typical bludgeoning of the Broncos. That was uh, that was not the case. <laughs> um, we still won. I mean, I'm happy that we won and that the Chiefs are keeping pace with the AFC with the AFC and the one seed in the Bills. Um, but, man, that was a tough game to watch. Um, basically, what happened was the Chiefs let a very, very bad Broncos team get back into the game, first and foremost. And then when they got back into the game, they let them hang around. And they almost soiled it. <laughs> I... Patrick Mahomes may have just thrown himself out of the MVP race. Um, I don't want to be a pessimist or anything like that, but a three-interception day does not look good on an MVP resume. And is it the kid? (laughs) Is it the newborn? Like, what, what is causing Patrick Mahomes to throw these absolutely boneheaded passes um, where he's telegraphing throws, he's throwing straight into double and triple coverage, he's no looking passes that he absolutely should look at, Uh, you know, yeah it was cute when he did that little no look flick to Jarek McKinnon very cute, very cool, tricked all the Broncos, got us a score I'm kind of getting tired of it (laughs) Uh, personally, I am. Uh, yeah, it's vintage Mahomes, and like everybody loves to see the circus that is Patrick Mahomes. Uh, it's gotten to a point where it's getting too cute. And that doesn't just go for Patrick Mahomes. That goes for the entire offensive play calling strategy. Um, we, the Chiefs easily could have put 50 points on this Broncos team if they just kept the foot to the pedal and stopped calling just god-awful 
calls. I mean, it, it, why are you throwing it on third and one? Why are you giving it to Michael Burton when everyone in the stadium knows that that's going to Michael Burton? The least you could do is mix it up a little bit. I mean, let me rephrase that because I'm currently contradicting myself. Um, basically, what I want out of the Chiefs is to stop being cute. And to stop being predictably cute. And I know to some that may be an oxymoron, but let's let's look at the facts here with the Chiefs offense at least. You got a lot of moving parts, you got a lot of potential weapons throughout every game, to a point of where a lot of those weapons are not getting the looks that they need. You need to diversify your offensive play calling and not use the same cutesy little plays, the shovel pass, the uh, little dorky thing that they do where they run a screen, but it it's actually this, but it's actually that. Like, it, Guys, just play simple football. I... Patrick Mahomes is a very gifted quarterback. He is. There's absolutely zero denying that. And he's got a lot of great weapons around him. So you can play simple football. You can. And I think a lot of what opposing defenses have has come to expect from the Chiefs is the fact that we are going to get cute. We are going to, you know, have lots and lots of moving parts. You can't be distracted by this guy, this guy, and this guy, when this guy's getting the ball 10,000 times a game, i.e. Travis Kelsey, whether uh, compared to this guy who's only getting like one or two catches a game, that being Marquez Valdez-Scantling or, um, say, Justin Watson, Sky Moore. Uh, you can't get all cute and stuff and then whittle down your offensive attack to two or three players. I mean, you just can't. You have to include your other weapons. Yeah, I realize that Marquez Valdez-Scantling has dropped some bad passes, but he's still a good wide receiver, and he can still make catches in crunch time, and he can still be... I mean, he proved it in Green Bay. He can. He's proven it here, too. And... To have a weapon like Marquez Valdez-Scantling and not use him until basically you've won the game is kind of bad play calling, in my opinion. It's it, Again, it is getting too cute with the weapons that, yeah, have established themselves, <clears throat> but opposing defenses know that they've established themselves. So they're going to put bodies on that guy no matter what, even if it's a fake to him. <clears throat> and to, to sign guys like MBS, Justin Watson, and to draft guys like Sky Moore and all that, you got to use them. And what has happened is this too cute play calling has been whittled down to Travis Kelsey... Isaiah Pacheco, Jarek McKinnon, and Patrick Mahomes just doing it himself. I mean, that's literally the offense thus far. And sometimes Juju Smith-Schuster. And sometimes Noah Gray. But you are not diversifying your play calling enough, and people are figuring it out, is, what, is the point that I'm getting at. You're getting too cute with the weapons that are already established, and it's killing you. I mean, it, it is. Everybody knows to cover Travis Kelsey. Everybody knows to cover Juju Smith-Schuster. Everybody knows that uh, it's pretty telling <laughs> when Isaiah Pacheco is going to get the ball or when Jarek McKinnon is going to get the ball. I mean, there's dead giveaways. On one of the interceptions that Patrick Mahomes threw, he telegraphed the throw the entire time. And that's exactly what I'm getting at. 
is Patrick Mahomes and the offensive powers that be need to d- diversify the attack because it's just it's going to the same five guys every game and it's, it's coming back to bite him in the butt and it came back to bite him in the butt today because the Broncos read it and they adjusted because they have a good uh, believe it or not the Broncos have a very good defense <laughs> and there's a lot of NFL teams that have a very good defense that does not include the Chiefs. Because now we're going to go to our defensive play calling. Why choose to not cover Jerry Judy after he gets one penalty? One. And complains about holding. I understand not wanting to tempt fate and not wanting to get those boneheaded pass interference calls and everything. But there was no pass interference called for a reason. It's because you're doing it right. And when it comes to coverage and being in coverage as a former defensive play, as a former defensive player myself. You're going to need to go hard on good receivers. You're going to need to be pushy with them. You're going to need to be physical with them. As long as you are playing the ball, there's no issue. And as long as you're not grabbing onto them and stuff like that, there's no issue. But if you're hand fighting and you're giving them a look, that's good corner play. That's how Darrell Revis thrived while he was on an island. That's how Sauce Gardner currently thrives. And none of our corners do that. Because Steve Spagnuolo tells them not to. (laughs) Steve Spagnuolo runs soft coverage on blitzes. That that shouldn't happen. (laughs) Especially with the safeties that we have. uh, The the, the safeties can't tackle. Nobody can, uh, hardly anybody can tackle. So why are you running soft coverage on blitzes? That's goofy. That's terrible defensive play calling. That's high school level. I understand having faith that your guys are going to get to the quarterback. And believe me, the Chiefs have gotten to the quarterback. I think they have the third most sacks out of any team. They're, They're a good pass rushing team now. This being said, when the pass rush doesn't work, it comes back to bite him, and it comes back to bite him hard, as we've seen over the past couple of games, as we've seen with Jomar Chase, as we've seen with Jerry Judy, as we've seen with Stephon Diggs. Like, good receivers are going to exploit that, and good quarterbacks are going to exploit that. Russell Wilson, yeah, he has not had the best year, But he's still a veteran, and he still recognizes, oh, man, they're in soft coverage. I'm just going to throw underneath, and this guy's going to gain 17 yards. Because they're playing soft coverage, and the safeties can't tackle. Juan Thornhill's missing tackles again, and I am still contemplating just going down there myself and saying, hey, put Brian Cook in. I mean... The, yeah, Brian Cook's green. He is. He's very green. And he's got a lot of raw skills that he still needs honing. But, man, at least the guy can tackle. At least the guy's not getting mossed every time the ball gets thrown his way. I mean, it, it's embarrassing to watch Juan Thornhill play sometimes. Yeah, he made a couple of good tackles today and made even a play in coverage or two. But that's not enough from a guy that that's your free safety? No. Uh Uh-uh. The free safety is supposed to be flying around the field. They're supposed to be making hits. They're supposed to be covering hard. And they don't. And one point, he doesn't. Because once again... Steve Spagnuolo 
plays coverage incredibly soft. And I get it. Yeah, you got you have young corners, you have young DBs. But these guys have shown that they can hang with the best. Joshua Williams has shown that he can hang with the best. Trent McDuffie has as well. And yeah, you might get a hold or a PI every now and then, given how the league calls that. But it's better than giving up 19 yards of a throwing play. Like, if these past couple games have taught us anything, it's the fact that the safety position among every other position in... The front seven's great. The front seven is good. Leave the front seven how it is. But the secondary... The secondary is just... They're young. Again, they are very young, and they will learn. But not without a coach that allows them to learn. That that puts them in these situations to where they can be great, or they can make a mistake that they learn from. Instead, they're putting them either on an island or in soft coverage where they get embarrassed because they have to make that open field tackle. And uh, God, they need to go back to fundamentals too because I, I cannot believe that there are this many NFL players that don't know how to make a proper tackle. <laughs> it, it is not hard. Yeah, it's easier said than done. I agree. But let's look at the facts here, folks. If you're at the NFL level, you should know how to tackle and tackle efficiently. I mean, that's that's what they teach you from Pop Warner. So, the Chiefs' defense has been incredibly disappointing. They've either had very, very good games or they've had very, very bad games. And so far, they're on a very, very bad game streak. And they are letting bad teams hang around with us. The Rams should not have been in that game to begin with. And yeah, the defense shored up when they needed to. But they should not have been in that game to begin with. And the same goes for the Broncos. I knew the Bengals were going to have a good game. And yeah, the offense put that defense in positions that they should not have been in. But good defenses battle through adversity. There's a reason the 2000 Ravens won the Super Bowl. And it wasn't because of Trent Dilfer. (laughs) It was because of that defense. And I'm not saying, oh, well, the Chiefs need the 2000 Ravens defense to, to to win the Super Bowl. No. They need a serviceable defense. They need a defense that can make plays when they need to, that can shore up in the face of adversity. And this is not that defense. And so long, in, in my opinion, so long as they're coached by Steve Spagnuolo, they're never going to be that defense. I'm not calling for the firing of Steve Spagnuolo just yet. If... If it leads to a first-round exit, then yeah, definitely. But I don't know how much longer I can stand watching soft coverage on a blitz. That doesn't make any sense. And, And with no spy on the quarterback... Russell Wilson ran for a ton of yards today because there was no spy whatsoever. You got, in my opinion at least, one of the best linebacking cores, definitely the best young linebacking core in the AFC, and you you choose to... Put them out in coverage instead of spying the quarterback in this day and age? Where pretty much every quarterback can run? Spare me it. One more thing about the Chiefs and I'm done. 
I talked about the Chiefs at length. The last Scorchcast, and I'm doing it again, my apologies. But this needs to be addressed too, and this is the last thing I'm going to address. Then we are moving on to KU. But stop talking. Plain and simple, stop talking crap. Justin Reed, Chris Jones, Frank Clark, it doesn't matter who. Stop talking. Off the field or on the field. Just stop. That's not leader behavior at all, and it is coming from the leaders of this defense. Frank Clark cost us 15 yards. Chris Jones cost us the game against the Colts. If that wasn't a wake-up call, <laughs> losing a game because you can't keep your mouth shut? I don't know what is. And then the whole thing with Justin Reed, I addressed that last week. It, it's, in, it's incredibly embarrassing that we have veteran players that need that feel the need... To get up in people's faces. That feel, I get it. Football's an emotional game. It's a tough game. But as a leader and as a veteran, you keep your mouth shut. You don't talk back to the referee. You don't talk to the opposing team in general, in my opinion. Except saying, hey, good game. Like... It's, it is quite literally lost the Chiefs' games. In, in my opinion, it's partly responsible for why they lost against the Bengals. Because the Bengals played with a chip on their shoulder. Because Justin Reed couldn't keep his mouth shut. Shut up and play football. And I, and I don't use that term lightly. I... I've athletes are human beings and we are emotional beings and yeah sometimes heat of the moment can catch on and everything but it's not heat of the moment at this point if you can't learn from these mistakes you are doomed to repeat them and eventually it might cost you more than a measly re regular season game against the Colts a game that should have been a give me, mind you. But it could cost you a playoff game. I mean, if you're going to let emotions get the best of you in that situation, playoff the playoffs is a prime time for emotions. And I swear. <laughs> If something happens where one of the defensive players can't keep their mouth shut and it costs us 15 yards in the game, in the playoff game, I'm going to call for the firing of everyone. Because frankly speaking, there are no leaders on this defense right now. Absolutely zilch. Zero. Not including Chris Jones. Not including Frank Clark. Not including Just Reed, Justin Reed. Hardly including Nick Bolton. Nick Bolton's probably the, the biggest leader, which is good because, you know, he's the key linebacker. Kind of, you know, the center of the defense. But, man, I, I miss the days of Derek, or excuse me, I miss, I miss the days of Derek Johnson. I miss the days of Eric Berry. I miss the days of... Um, Drawing a blank. Uh, I've drawn a blank. What was I going to say? There was one more person. Justin Houston. My apologies. Um, Brandon Flowers, even. Like, these guys were leaders and they kept their mouths shut. What we have right now are guys that put me before team. On this defense. When they shouldn't. They have no right to. They're a bad defense. How about you shore up your play? 
before you open your mouth. I don't know. I think that's a key talking point that Andy Reid needs to have with his defense. I Spag- Spagnuolo is not going to have that. Spagnuolo doesn't lead that defense. It, at least he doesn't have my respect. I can't say that he's got the respect of his defensive players because they keep screwing him over. I don't know. End of the Chiefs rant. Um, in summary, if you didn't catch it, Chiefs should have won by a lot more, and they have a lot of work to do before they get to the playoffs. It was good to see Brandon Williams make his debut. Made some key behind-the-scenes plays. Didn't really make anything of note, but you know he was there. He was a good plug, and... Yeah, the rest of the schedule's easy, but these games need to be used as tune-up games. You cannot... You cannot lose these games. I mean, you just can't. If you are a playoff-bound team, you cannot lose against the Texans. You cannot let the Broncos hang around. You cannot... Chiefs need to win out. Otherwise, I'm color me disappointed. So, that's my humble opinion. Maybe I'm being reactionary, but... (laughs) Is there a lie? Am Am I missing something? I don't know. I feel like we have a lot of angry Chiefs fans after that game, so... Leave a comment down below about uh, what your thoughts are on the recent Chiefs struggles. Um, Best ones make it feature. Uh, Anyway, onward to the Border War showdown or whatever you want to call it. Um, KU played, or excuse me, KU went to Columbia and played against the old. Missouri Tigers of uh, old border war infamy. Um, And it went about how I expected it to go. I think Mizzou got incredibly overconfident because they were 9-0 against teams such as such as juggernauts really. Um, Such as Southeast Missouri State Texas Christian, or not Texas Christian, that would be a good team. Um, Houston Baptist, I think, was the was the team that y'all beat so handily. Barely beating Wichita State. As a Mizzou basketball person, like, what did you expect? Yeah. <laughs> And this is, yes, this is coming from a KU alum and a KU basketball fan. So you can take my opinion with a grain of salt. But you guys were not going to win that. You, the, this That team came in incredibly overconfident. They had the backing of the student section that, you know, for once, the backing of the student section... Um, I think that is going to be gone now, um, but I mean, you just you guys just got embarrassed on your home court, and your fans looked embarrassing too. I mean, throwing objects onto the court, getting yelling at the players. I mean, you know, it's the border war and everything like that. But when you're getting blown out by twenty, maybe it's time to relax a little. Maybe it's maybe you're getting mad at the wrong thing. Or you know, you could just leave if you're that upset. But this only further proves the point of why the border war was not played for so long after Missouri left for the SEC. And that's because of strength of schedule. I think Mizzou had a 
paltry. And it's proven by Ken Palm and everything like that, that it was paltry. They had an absolutely paltry nine games to start the season. And they went 9-0. and What should have been expected. But instead, people that say they watch Mizzou basketball but really don't, uh, i.e. the Mizzou student body, uh, <laughs> and alumni body, got confident because they saw, hey, our basketball team's 9-0. and Oh man, we beat a team that was good, you know, six years ago. We're going to go all the way to the championship. You need a rest. You guys are not back. You guys cannot compete with good ranked teams. You just can't. I mean, you, I love your new coach. Dennis Kate's a great coach, and I think you guys have promise. But you guys are not at that competitive level yet. I mean, you just aren't. So what did you expect? And for KU, par for the course. I mean, looks good. <laughs> I have no complaints as a KU basketball fan. I, I thought we handled the first road test in an incredibly hostile environment with a lot of poise. You know, there was no back talk. There was no, you know, jawing at people and everything like that. Yeah, Jalen Wilson, you know, talked his talk to the fans and everything like that. But, I mean, again, it's the border war. So it's things like that are going to happen. Even if you were blowing out a team by 20. And, you know, maybe that was part of it. But I think it was a very adverse reaction from the fans. Yeah, they're going to talk that talk on the court. It's a competitive sport. E even if even if KU were playing Monmouth. I don't want to say that it would be to that degree. I mean, I'm sure Jalen would probably not talk crap to Monmouth. <laughs> but what I'm saying is this. You guys lost and you lost handily. And Mizzou's overconfidence showed in droves last night. And if anything, this blowout is good for MU basketball. Because it shows where they're at right now. I think those first nine games didn't show us hardly anything. I think that game against Wichita State showed that, you, that this team has resolve and can win close games but put them up against the conference competition that they have Tennessee, Kentucky, Alabama and the same goes for football too like I would much rather have a really good program that wins championships while having, you know, maybe a program that's a little bit behind the ball, i.e. KU with basketball and football, then have two chronically average to mediocre teams. And that's what you have with Mizzou, are two chronically average programs to, to, to just straight-up bad programs. And... Until you can reach the mountaintop of a national championship or being ranked even. I think Mizzou has absolutely zero room to talk to KU. Absolutely zero. And yeah, I'm a KU guy. Sue me. I don't care. I... Again, this is my opinion. This is not fact. But I don't think Mizzou is anywhere close to touching KU's athletic programs. SEC or not. I mean, they just aren't. As a whole, 
You guys just aren't close. And that's coming from someone that used to work for KU Athletics, mind you. So. And has seen Mizzou Athletic Facilities, by the way. But, border war being done. Um, you know, for KU, this was just kind of a tune-up game, as is normal. Um, to go into, I think... I think KU actually plays someone pretty good next week. Let me check. Let me check, shall we? That uh, was yesterday. Let's check and see who KU plays. So KU's going to play Indiana next week. So yeah, no, I, I knew we had pretty big time ranked matchup coming up. And yeah, that'll, that'll be a good one. Um... I think this Mizzou game definitely gives KU confidence. Hopefully they won't go in overconfident like Mizzou did um, and then get run out of their own gym. Uh, I think KU's at Indiana, though, for today or for next Saturday. Yeah, they're they're in Assembly Hall. So um, hopefully, you know, KU can show out like they did. Good shooting, efficient defense, Uh Lots of great discipline, no fouling, everything like that. Indiana's going to have some good shooters. They've got good front court play, and it'll be a tough matchup. But I think KU has all the tools to beat Indiana. Sorry, Patrick and friends. Um, not like you care. I mean, Patrick, you went to grad school there. Um, you should be a Jayhawk fan in this case. So uh, if that's any convincing for you. Um as for Mizzou, let me look and see here. And then we'll get into K-State as well. Just, you know, just because. Uh, Mizzou's got UCF next week, and then they have a couple of really tough games coming up. Um, which is why, again, this loss, you know, by almost 30 points kind of looms large. Um, because you have UCF, who is not exactly a cupcake, They've played some decent squads, and they've been a regular at the tournament. Um, they're, they're not a team that you'll just go in and beat the brakes off of. Uh, right now, it's looking like UCF has a 55.4 chance of winning that game. Um, and they've got some shooters on that team. So, just fair warning to Missouri. And then you have back-to-back matchups against two ranked teams and one of those ranked teams is Kentucky so um, and then Illinois too which is another rivalry game mind you uh, at away at Illinois it, you guys got too confident too quick I mean plain and simple that's what happened I mean you cannot be confident in a basketball team that only wins by eight against Southeast Missouri State. You know, nothing against the Red Hawks. Good program down there in Cape Girardeau. Pretty, uh, pretty mid-basketball team. <laughs> um, I, I don't, I don't know if they've ever made a tournament. <laughs> Again, no offense to anyone that went to SEMO or anything like that. I'm sure you got you guys got a really good football program this year, but uh, <laughs> and you almost beat Missouri too, so you know. <laughs> but yeah, the, that Illinois and Kentucky game they loom awful large, and depending on how those go, will be the probably the definition of Missouri's season this year. Uh, we are going to see the true medal of Missouri um, December 22nd and December 28th. So, yeah, conference opener against Kentucky. Uh, that's a tough one. So, But uh, let's go to K-State basketball. K-State basketball is doing pretty well for themselves. They're kind, of, they're kind of in the same boat as Missouri. Is, they're kind of playing some pretty... 
I mean, they've, they've played a better schedule than Missouri has by quite a bit. Um, but it's still not like teams of real any true any true note. Let me go ahead and... Yeah, I mean, their last game was against Incarnate Word. They beat them by 48. Don't get me wrong, but Incarnate Word is already 5-6. Uh, and six. So when, you know, good teams around this time are, you know, nine-win teams, which K-State has nine wins. So, uh, but so far in December, uh, they've beaten Wichita State by five, Abilene Christian by a handy amount, and then Incarnate Word, like I said. And then they beat a good, uh, that, that LSU game, that LSU game, that's, that's a good win. Um, and that's what Mizzou really was missing, was a good win like that. Uh, Wichita State's not going to be anything of note this, this season. I'll say that right now. They're just not. I mean, when Abilene Christian almost beat you, <laughs> in fact, I, I think they beat them, actually. Al, no, no, no. Alcorn State beat Wichita. And, yeah. <laughs> but, you know, good wins over K-State uh, or LSU. <laughs> um, Rhode Island's a solid, solid squad. Uh, Nevada's decent. It, these are quality wins. Uh, and it'll be good tune-up for once you hit that conference play. Um, you know, and they open up conference against West Virginia. I think that's right on par for where they should be opening at. I think that'll be a really, really good game. Um, so far, Jerome Tang's proven why they hired him. I, in my opinion, I, I think he's done a miraculous job so far and in both recruiting and in play. Um, but we'll see how that, that conference play goes. I, I can see K-State uh, vying for one of those top middle spots or even in that top four to five range. So, um, yeah, solid solid display by, K, by K-State so far. And again, I think that KU loss for Missouri will be a wake-up call. Um, it'll kind of humble the Tigers a little bit, give them a little slice of humble pie. So that's that's good for them. So, um, in other news, KU women's basketball just had a very high-quality win, a twenty-point win over Wichita State, and then a twenty-point win away against 14th ranked Arizona. They're going to be ranked after this week. They are. And they look like they are in prime position to win, to have a shot at the Big 12, uh, the, at the Big 12 championship, which is insane because normally you see teams like Baylor, Texas, you know, women's basketball just doesn't really change all that much in terms of like the top teams. It's a lot like college football. I mean, you got your powerhouses like UConn, Baylor, um, 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 Stanford, South Carolina, like all these teams. And then you got, you know, the rest. Uh, in this case, KU looks like they have a every shot at being a potential game breaker and being a potential team that goes really far in the tournament which is saying something for this women's program because this women's program has long since not been all that great i mean their last tourney appearance was in 2013 and they went to the sweet 16 yes um or actually they may have gone last year if i remember correct i i can't remember honestly my apologies but they went to the sweet 16 in 2013 and you know now that i think of it i think they did make make it last year but um this is this is a solid program if you watch them play they're dominant i mean this lights out shooting high paced offense um really really good front court play especially for a women's team no less um and that's you know obviously well I don't want to say obviously because you do have a lot of great front court presences such as Brittany Griner, such as, you know, um, oh, 
I'm drawing a blank on others, but Lisa Leslie and all of them, um, just, you know, you, you have mostly perimeter shooters, though, in the women's game. And to have good front court play is a rarity. And KU has that, as well as good perimeter shooting. So they're kind of a brick wall right now. Um, they're, they're winning games, and they're winning games handily. So I'm excited to see how this season goes for KU, uh, KU women's and KU men's. Uh, I think KU is finally turning that corner, and that's just another product. It's just another byproduct of what Travis Goff has done for this KU athletics. Um, I think he's, you know, allowed this pro allowed these programs to take a turn for the better. The football program, the women's basketball program, uh, basketball, of course, won the national title. It, it there is a change happening and not just football and it's a lot in part to Travis Goff and you know he's a he's a colleague of mine he's a friend of mine and I've I've loved what he's done so far and he he's he's just a solid guy both on and off the court you know um so kudos to him for that but kudos to the KU women too man that just are rinsing through competition right now um you know that K-State women's basketball is going pretty well too and I think it'll be a battle between Kansas schools once they face off against each other so good women's basketball is just some more icing on the cake for Kansas City sports am I right um, going on to uh, our kind of second to last topic, I know that this may be the last topic that I mentioned in the description, but, um, and this show's kind of dragging on, as I said, but I promise I'm going to study for finals after this. Don't hold me to it. I don't need to be held to it. I promise. Um, I got everything pulled up, I swear. Um, but it... What was I going to say? Oh, yeah. Um, KC Blues, this is the last day to donate towards Don Bosco. Um, if you don't have that already, donate to Tim Clumpers. That is T-I-M-K-L-U-E-M-P-E-R-S. Um, at Tim Clumpers on Venmo. If you want to be a part of Don Bosco, if you can't be there to give out toys for the kids, this is a great way to be a part of it. And like I said, this is the last day they're accepting donations because after this, it's going to be a week filled of giving toys to those kids that are underserved, that are in underserved communities. Um, I've done my part in donating a little bit and giving back a little bit. Um, and you should too. Uh, this is, by the way, this is not my charitable initiative. This is the Kansas City Blues and St. Thomas Aquinas uh, High School initiative. My initiative is coming, though. Um, I'll probably announce it next week, so stay tuned for that. Um, but yeah, go support Don Bosco. Go support Kansas City Blues. Go support St. Thomas Aquinas High School. And go donate and support your community. So um, if you don't know me, you know, or you know me. You know I'm a big guy on charity. I mean, obviously, the Movember campaign um, and other campaigns that I'm planning on doing right now. Um, I've always been huge on charity and huge on helping out the community and being being a good community member. Um, so just, you know, do what you can. So, um, one last thing that I wanted to talk about, kind of ending it on. A little bit of a sad note here, so my apologies, but um, I hate to say it, but the passing of Grant Wall, um, if you don't already know, happened. Um, Grant Wall was a Kansas native of Shawnee Mission East High School and was a sports reporter um, and soccer journalist that really brought the Kansas City soccer community to the national spotlight as well as being a really good reporter on college basketball too. Um, he, um, reported on KU basketball a ton. Uh, it's kind of how he got his start. He's a KU alum, I believe. Um, 
and just it, it's absolutely devastating. Um, he died in Qatar covering the Netherlands Argentina game. He collapsed um, for what they believe is a prior illness that he had um, a couple days back. There are complications regarding that. I hope and pray that's the case. Um, but obviously, with everything going on with the Qatar World Cup right now, and you know the death of the labor that's happening, the the, the death of the people that are doing labor over there, um, as well as just kind of the overall shadiness of it, you can't help but speculate. Unfortunately, um, I and again, I hope and pray that that is not the case, and that Grant died in accidental death it still hurts a ton he's far far too young to die um at age 48 he's survived by his wife um and it's just an incredibly incredibly sad past couple of days for the kc sports journalism world um the soccer journalism world the soccer world in general and just it it sucks i mean it does and, you know, having seen Grant a couple times at public appearances, unfortunately, I never got to meet the guy face to face. Um, you could tell that he was just that that type of presence, you know, um, just the kind of guy that lights up a room that is willing to just drop everything and help out um, and is just a servant to his community. And... He will be incredibly missed, um, and I hope that uh, I hope that we can get his body back to the states, and I hope that if justice needs to be served, that it is served. Um, that being said, we don't know a whole lot as of yet, and this, by all accounts, looks like it could have been in regard to what he was suffering um, earlier in the week. But, you know, Grant Wall, uh, rest in peace. Um, again, sorry to end it on kind of a sad, depressing note, but unfortunately, stuff happens. Life happens. And sports, it, it's bigger than sports. And... You, you got to acknowledge that. So um, this has been the Burn KC signing off. Um, I hope you all have a great night. Um, go watch some Sunday night football. Should be a really good game between Chargers Dolphins. I'll kind of have it on in the background while I'm studying. I'm not going to try not to look at it. Just get off my back. Gosh, I'm going to study. I promise. I want to get a good grade. Um, but... Yeah, just hug your loved ones. It's the holiday season. Um, and just be a good person. Be a good human. So This is the Burn KC signing off. Again, have a great night, and I will see you all next Sunday. Cheers.